we'll get started now. So um, thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on the decline of family child care in California. Um, this is a topic that's very important to us, so we're excited to be able to share um, what we've found and what we've been thinking about. So just a few housekeeping. Um, everybody is muted since it's such a large audience. Um, if you have a question, you can type it into the question box. And we have Sherry Zhang, our research and policy associate, who will be monitoring those. And we'll leave time at the end of the call to read them out and answer them. Um, if you have any technical difficulties while on the webinar, please contact Selene McCullough. Um, their email and phone number is below. And Sherry's also typing it into the, um, the chat box so you can reference it later on. So on the call, um, there's me, Gemma DiMatteo. I'm the research director here at the network, and I'll be the one presenting on the data and the research that we've done around this issue. And then we also have Keisha, who will introduce herself now. Good morning, everyone. This is Keisha Nzeri, and I'm the public policy director for the network. And towards the end of our webinar, I'll just be looking ahead at our, um, at our recommendations. So our agenda today, uh, we'll start with an overview of resource and referral in California um, and who we are, the network, and our collective history with family child care. Then we'll go into some of the data on the change in supply, um, why this is important, and some of the factors that influence this. Um, and then we'll have Keisha with the policy implications and recommendations. Um, and then we'll leave time at the end for any questions or discussion from you all. So just a little background on who we are and why this issue is so important to us. Uh, the California Child Care Resource and Referral Network, otherwise known as the network, is a statewide membership organization. And our members are the 57 Child Care Resource and Referral Agencies, um, which I'll just refer to as R&Rs, in California. There's at least one in each county, and collectively they serve the entire state of California. Um, so R&Rs have existed in California since the 1970s. Uh, they're funded by CDE, the California Department of Education, and they provide free resources to families and child care providers in their community, as well as track the supply and demand of care and work to increase the supply of child care that meets their family's needs, which means having an array of different child care options. Uh, so the network, we started in 1980 out of a grassroots effort from the RNRs, and we act as a coordinating um, agency for the RNRs. So um, we, along with the RNRs, have always valued parent choice, and we've worked to expand quality supply that meets families where they are, which is why we've always supported in home care, which includes family child care and license exempt care, uh, which historically these types of care have received less attention than centers. Um, in fact, our late founder, Patty Siegel, along with some other partners, sued the state of California in Doe versus Oblito. Um, and this was in 1975 when Jerry Brown was actually governor the first time. Um, and they sued them for discriminatory policies that prevented women from opening family child care homes if they weren't married or didn't speak English. Um, and we won. And this resulted in the resource and referral system and the alternative payment program, as well as the Family Child Care Home Education Network. So in the mid to late 1980s, um, the Child Care Initiative Project, otherwise known as SIP, was put into legislation um, through CDE to help build the supply of child care providers. And each R&R receives a contract, receives a SIP contract, which they use to recruit, train, and support family child care providers in their community. So the R&Rs have a really close relationship to this type of care. So using the, the local R&R agencies and um, our network coordination uh, enables the SIP program to be an infrastructure of support for family child care providers. So the network, um, with its reach in every county across the state, has been tracking the complex landscape of child care in California for decades. And with the benefit of our community-based R&R organizations, we can keep our focus on the diverse needs of the families and providers in California, while also doing statewide policy advocacy work. 
So all of the data in this webinar on the supply of licensed care, including family child care, comes from our California child care portfolios. So since 1997, the network has produced the biennial California child care portfolio. So every two years, um, we release this report. And it presents data on uh, licensed child care supply, demand from families, and the cost statewide and county by county, as well as other demographic information on employment, poverty, and family budgets. Um, and the child care data that we use in this report is gathered with the assistance of the resource and referral agencies. And this report's been consistently relied upon by policymakers, business leaders, healthcare professionals, planning agencies, and other advocates to understand the child care needs and the supply of child care in uh, California. So you can see all of our old portfolios. Um, actually, I think they only go back to 2007 on our website, as well as um, look for your specific county's information from any of the years. And um, just an FYI, the 2019 portfolio is scheduled to come out early 2020. So keep your, um, your eyes open for that. Um, and then the second data source, that we'll talk about is from a survey of family child care providers that we did in 2017, and this was funded by First Five LA. Um, the third data source, which is more uh, just qualitative and anecdotal, is feedback that we asked the RNRs for on um, what they've noticed in their communities for reasons contributing to the change in family child care. So um, just a little overview, there are two types of licensed child care. There are centers and family child care homes. And like centers, family child care homes receive a license from community care licensing. Um, and it's actually the individual provider that receives that license. Um, and it is, they're small businesses run out of the provider's home. So it's an individual starting a small business out of their home. And there are two types of license. There's um, a small, which has a capacity uh, usually of eight, and then a large, which has a capacity of 14. And if it's a large home, there needs to be two adults. So often they'll have to hire an assistant. Um, and a family child care license, unlike center licenses, encompass all ages. So it doesn't um, distinguish between an infant or preschool or school age license. Um, but there are restrictions based on the configuration of ages. So, for example, since infants require higher adult to child ratio, there's a maximum number of infants you can have. Um, and if you're at full capacity, there's also a minimum number that have to be school age children. And the uh, family child care workforce is predominantly female and for the most part represents the racial, ethnic and linguistic diversity of California's children. So this graph shows the change in licensed child care supply from 1996 to 2017, and it shows both the center supply and the family child care supply. So you'll notice that the center-based care has remained fairly stable over the years, and for family child care, the decline started around um, after the Great Recession in 2008. And this was in large part due to home foreclosures. And with parents losing their jobs, there was less demand for childcare. It was more difficult for the providers that remained open to fill their spaces. Um, and so now, although the economy has stabilized and unemployment is low, the supply continues to decline at a pretty steady pace. And so this is showing just the family child care home spaces. Um, and this is the, the capacity or the number of, of spaces in the home, not the number of homes. Um, from 2008, the number of these spaces has decreased by 26%. And this equates to over 98,000 less spaces or children without access. And so this is the number of actual homes um, or businesses. And since 2008, there's been a 30% decrease. Um, and so this is almost one in three less businesses. Um, and it, this also equates to almost 12,000 less homes or businesses in California. 
And so this shows the change in family child care homes um, by region since 2008. And you'll notice that the highest, um, the, the steepest decline is in the north, followed by the Central Valley, and then the south, and then the Bay Area. So this shows the top 10 counties with the largest family child care home decrease. Um, and actually the, the highest percentage is um, Alpine County with 100%, but it, it's only one or two homes that close because the county is so small, so they're not on here. But um, you can see that these counties are in line with what we see um, in the last slide with the decline by region. Most of these counties, um, with the exception of a couple, are in the North or Central Valley. So this is a visual representation of the statewide change by county since 2008. So um, each map shows the change in family child care supply compared to 2008. So um, if you look at the legend, green is an increase in supply, and then yellow to red is a decrease. So the first map, this is comparing 2008 to 2010, and there was a fair amount of increase, and the decrease wasn't too steep yet. Um, and this is because the nonprofit and service sector experienced a lag effect versus lead effect post-recession. Then from 2008 to 2012, it starts to darken a little bit more. Um, 2012 was when the California budget had a huge deficit and our child care system was proposed to be dismantled and cut drastically. So you can see by 2014, we see the largest decrease. Um, it gets much darker, more red. Um, and then from 2008 to 2017, it starts to lighten up a little bit, but it's still nowhere near the 2008 levels. And just a little explanation, if, if we were back at the 2008 levels, you would see more of these colors showing less of a, a change. So visually, you can see in these maps the hardest hit areas of our state and also the areas that have been faster to recover or that have remained um, pretty resilient. Like you can see the tiny San Francisco has remained green. So why do we care about family child care? Other than the fact that the decline in family child care is the biggest contributor to the overall decline in licensed care, family child care homes are important because they meet uh, many families' unique needs. And one of the main benefits of family child care homes is that they're more likely to care for infants and toddlers, which is notoriously difficult to find in licensed care. Um, only 7% of center spaces are licensed to care for infants. Um, so this is total center spaces, licensed center spaces in California. This is actually rounded up. It's like 6.8 or something percent that care for infants. And then translated to what that means for infants in California, it only reaches 5%. So this table is taken directly from our 2017 child care portfolio. And this shows another important factor of homes, which is that on average, they're more affordable than centers, um, especially for infants. You can see down here, this is a pretty significant difference for a family, especially if it's a, a lower middle wage family. Um, Another important aspect of family child care homes is that they're more likely to offer non-traditional hours of care. So this is evening, weekend, or overnight care. And you can see here, it's 41% of homes versus 3% of centers that offer this kind of care. Um, there's increasingly more parents in California that work outside the traditional sort of Monday through Friday, nine to five schedule. And so, and many of those jobs are lower wage, so they can't necessarily afford to have somebody come to their home and watch their kids while they're working. Um, and so homes do meet this need um, much more frequently than centers. Another thing is that homes are more likely to offer both full-time or part-time spaces, um, whereas centers are less likely to do so. So 80% of homes offer both types. 
And then this is just anecdotally, but um, homes tend to be more flexible with families. So for example, you don't get charged uh, for being five minutes late to pick up. Um, family child care providers are more likely to care extended hours if there's um, a last minute need or emergency. Um, and they're also more likely to fit the family's cultural and linguistic preferences. And um, also often parents are more comfortable leaving an infant in a home environment rather than a center. So this is from our um, family child care survey. So these are responses directly from family child care providers. Uh, we surveyed 237 providers, both current and um, former, in nine counties in Ventura, San Bernardino, San Luis Obispo, Fresno, Nevada, El Dorado, and Plumas. And when they were asked to rank um, challenges in order, um, of most difficult in keeping their business open. These were the ones that rose to the top for both open and closed homes. Um, so these percentages show the percentage of participants that ranked this challenge as their number one challenge. Um, and so not surprisingly, low wages was number one for the open family child care homes, followed by the knowledge that there are employment options with other employment options with benefits, and then um, difficulty filling their program. And then for the closed providers, um, family, circumstance, family circumstances was the top reason, followed by the employment options with benefits, and then housing. Um, so the survey also asked for um, open-ended or free response questions from the providers. Um, and based on these comments, it's clear that family child care providers are doing a labor of love and often receive very little in return. Uh, the top challenges um, that providers faced were all related to the pay, benefits, and difficulty filling their program. But the cost of care is already unaffordable for families, which um, is possibly contributing to the difficulty in filling the programs. So raising parent fees is not really an option. Um, according to a cost of care survey that we did in 2014, providers were making up lost revenues by working longer hours to make ends meet, which um, often leads to burnout. Uh, many providers expressed frustration with increased requirements and regulations without funding, time, or respect in return. And additionally, large family child care homes, as I mentioned before, need to hire an assistant. And that means they have to follow the minimum wage requirements for the assistant. Um, and these are steadily increasing, which leaves little left for the main provider to actually take home. Um, and of the providers who have closed their businesses, the top reasons after family circumstances were employment options with benefits and housing. Um, and at a time when both buying and renting housing is becoming increasingly less affordable, and in an economy where there are other jobs that offer more stability and benefits, running a childcare business out of one's home is increasingly less feasible. Um, another common theme that came out in these responses was the importance of social connections and support. So many providers expressed gratitude for family, friends, uh, associations, and networks that supported them in this difficult line of work. However, those that didn't have those resources felt isolated and wanting for professional support and connection. So uh, these are some direct quotes taken from the survey. Uh, and this was in response to a question that asked them what would or would have been helpful for them. Um, so I'm going to read these. A network of substitutes who are background cleared and could work in any facility when someone is ill, at the minimum paid sick days, more in-depth workshops for financial planning, cost of living increases, retirement, health care access to grants and or fundraising for in-home child care rather than having to be licensed differently to be able to access them. For most, in-home child care is the owner's livelihood and often the owner has to make personal sacrifices to keep and pay employees and tips or help from previous child care providers. So these insights provide important feedback for policymakers, system designers, and advocates, and they're all associated with solutions that are within reach. So it's really, helpful and important to listen to what the providers are saying if we want to maintain our supply of licensed care. So 
we've shown data from the statewide perspective and then from the individual provider's perspective, but we also asked the R&R agencies to provide feedback on what they see happening in their communities for more of like a community or mid-level view, if you will. Um, and remember that through the Child Care Initiative Project, they have a lot of contact with family child care providers in their area, so they're able to keep um, a pretty good pulse on what's going on. So we culled through their responses and the top reasons that they mentioned contributing to the family child care decline in their community was uh, retirement, young people not interested in coming into the field, affordability and housing issues, leaving for a different job, and increased regulations and requirements. So um, although we, we grouped the responses by region, these were pretty consistent statewide. And for the most part, these are also consistent with the individual providers responses. One of the most interesting things that came out of this feedback, though, was this issue, um, the combination of older providers retiring and then younger generations not interested in opening a family child care home. So there's sort of this aging out of the field without replacements coming in. And um, one of the main reasons is actually also related to housing. So less young people now own their homes and more live in shared housing, whether it's multi-generational or with roommates. Um, and to open a family child care home, everybody in the house has to get fingerprinted and background checked, as well as be on board with a uh, child care business operating in their home. Um, and you also need enough space to, to operate a family child care home. Um, another issue with housing is the issue of quality. So we heard this especially in the north, um, although the housing might not be as expensive as urban areas, and this is actually probably changing with the natural disasters and um, competition by second home owners recently, um, it can still be difficult to find housing that meets licensing standards. Um, and then also in areas that are more uh, tourism areas, there's competition from renting out one's home for income that makes opening a family child care home less appealing. And um, what I mean by this is, for example, if you have an extra bedroom, you could rent out that bedroom for one day a week and likely make as much money as if you were operating a family child care home um, 10 hours a day. So um, another thing is that many RNRs mentioned providers leaving the field for a different job or leaving their business for a different job, sometimes in the same field, sometimes in a different field. Um, and benefits was cited over and over again, both in the provider survey and with the RNRs. Um, and this probably also contributes to the reason why young people aren't interested in entering this field. Um, as mentioned in the survey, in today's economy, there are options to work jobs outside the home where even if they're also low wage jobs, they'll make a similar amount of money um, as they would opening a family child care home. And then they also get benefits. They get, um, often they get benefits, sick leave, vacation, health insurance. And in many ways, it's less stressful than caring for children out of your home and often committing to very long days. Um, even having a 10 minute break or a 30 minute lunch break is something that family child care providers don't really get. So then the last piece, um, the increased regulation and requirements, this was also mentioned frequently in the provider survey, um, as well as uh, with the R&Rs. So there's consistently more regulations and requirements placed on family child care providers. And when they're making such low wages and not really respected in society, for many of them, it ends up not being worth it. For example, the health and safety training requirements um, that you need to do to get licensed is often very far from the provider's home or can be difficult to get to, and this can be prohibitive in opening a business, especially in rural areas or if the provider doesn't speak English, um, it can be even more difficult. Um, another example is um, community care licensing, um, new sl safe sleep regulations, which um, have not been implemented yet, and they're still being finalized, but um, some of the things in conversation are, for example, a mandate that every child needs their own pack and play or like individual sleep space. Um, and there's a minimum amount of um, washing that needs to happen, which um, I, this isn't the case and it's being changed, but originally the idea was that they'd have to be washed every day. Um, and then there's like a sleep record. So providers need to um, check on sleeping children every 15 minutes. Meanwhile, they have other children in the house um, and probably other parts of the house. So it all just contributes to um, a, a very difficult situation for the providers. 
Um, and then also if providers participate in the Quality Counts California, um, there's people coming in to their homes and telling them what's wrong with the things in their house. And um, based on provider feedback, this can be um, a, a difficult experience for them. So one of the main takeaways from both the provider survey and the r, &R comments is burnout. Uh, family child care providers work a lot. They work very long hours um, with little to no time for themselves, and they make very little money. So without increased support, this trend in their decline will continue. So I'm going to hand it off now to Keisha, who will talk about some of the proposed um, policy changes that can help turn this curve around. If your mind isn't already boggled, um, well, you weren't paying attention. But hi, everyone. This is Keisha. And um, I'm just going to talk about a few recommendations we have um, that address many of the issues that Gemma uh, just went over. So she talked about quite a bit. She mentioned several times the SIP program, the Child Care Initiative Project, which has been around for almost 30 years. It was established in 1985, in fact, as just a pilot in California, but it has stood the test of time. Um, SIP is in every R&R, provided by every R&R in every county, and the purpose uh, of it is to help build supply and maintain supply. That was its initial intent and continues to be its intent today. Um, but the investment that the state makes in SIP is actually fairly minimal. Um, compared to the entire ECE budget. So like I mentioned, it's it's in every county and every state, but it's only funded at around $4 million. And it requires that every organization that receives the SIP funding, which is every R&R, &R, um, have a two-for-one state match at the local level. Um, so SIP is leveraged to do so many things besides supporting licensed family child care providers. Um, it supports license exempt providers. Most recently, SIP is um, pr providing trauma-informed care training to all providers. And so if you think about it, they're, they're doing so much work um, in supporting our supply, but in the context of an entire early care budget in California, $4 billion, it's only one-tenth of one percent of that budget. And so it makes it very hard that although we've seen this 30% decline in family child care homes since the recession, um, it's, we still in California have a very large number of providers to serve on very little money. Um, last year, SIP was fortunate to receive a one-time $5 million investment, um, again, with the purpose of supporting and retaining current providers and bringing in new providers, but that, again, was one time, and it really deserves an ongoing investment to make sure parents have the widest choice possible and availability possible of care. Our second recommendation is increasing infant to and toddler rates. It is true, as um, Jim mentioned, that infant care and toddler care requires a adult and child ratio um, that is higher or well, lower than with old, older children. So you can only have, in a family child care home, you can't have, um, or in any setting, you it's usually two infants to one adult. Um, and so that means that if a family child care provider does care for infants, and most do, then they have fewer children total in their care. And so rates really need to reflect the actual cost of providing child care. Now, there is a higher rate provided by the state through our voucher system for infants and toddlers. Um, but like all the rates that the state provides, it's insufficient to cover the cost of care and insufficient to providing a living wage for the people providing that care. Um, so there's two concurrent bills being run this year, AB 125, sponsored by Assemblyman McCarty and SB 174, authored by Senator Leva. Um, they will be identical, and they are going to take on the recommendations of the rate reform work group, um, which they have put forth. And the two main things that are relevant to this discussion is that it would develop a single rate 
system reimbursement structure that compensates providers for the cost of care where they live. So it would the, the actual cost of care. So in higher cost of living areas, it's going to cost more to provide care versus lower cost of of living areas, and it would take that into account. But also, it would help lift the quality of care in all settings, including home-based settings, by providing increased rates um, for meeting that, those higher quality standards, which cost more to do. Um, so that that right, that policy change would go a long way. Oh, maybe not the longest way, but it would move us closer to be able to help providers actually earn an income that helps that allows them to support their own families. Um, another recommendation is that that the voucher system is based on enrollment. So, if you when our voucher system was created, it was the intent of the legislature that the system would mirror the private pay system. So if you've ever yourself had to pay for child care, you know that you pay the same amount for your child care in December, even though your provider may be closed for two weeks, as you do in October. Um, you pay the same amount whether your child has to leave for a doctor's appointment or um, you take a family vacation. Um, or you're there every day that care is available that month. And when you do that, it, it, the provider has stability. They know, just like all of us who depend on a paycheck each month, that may be the same amount no matter what, if you're salaried, but, or the same amount when you work the same amount of hours per month, a provider needs that same type of stability in order to plan um, her own finances so we need a system um, that is based on enrollment and not on days or hours of care because when it's done that way, a child and, um, may only come, let's say, 10 out of the 20 days available in a month of care and that provider is only paid for those 10 days, but she can't just find another infant to take that spot um, to fill in the gap because it may be... Um, on, well, we when we talk about family child care home being available for non-predictable or non-traditional schedules, which also may be non-predictable schedules, then you can't find someone to fill in those rest of those days. Um, so she's not getting paid for a full month of care compared to the private market. And then finally, um, we propose the shared services model. So I think so, it's very easy to forget that a family child care home is a small business, whether it's a small or a large child care home, it's a business. And that provider is all things to her entire business. Um, it means that there's, she has, there's no HR department, there's no custodial service, um, there's no accounting service. That provider is all things to her business. Um, and there's no support or infrastructure provided to family child care home providers um, to sustain themselves. So while she's also taking care of children, and as Gemma mentioned, in many cases just extending hours and really being on the brink of burnout just to be able to make ends meet, um, she also has to counsel parents, teach the children and care for the children and cook and clean um, and take care of the books and do her taxes um, enroll, recruit, advertise, all of those things with very little financial resources um, and may even be required to take out loans that charge interest that then puts the business in further danger if they aren't able to pay it back. And so a shared services model would allow um, for 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 family child care providers to work more closely together and combine resources to be able to do all of those things. But to also, it could be shared resources means also like sharing curriculum and things like that, but also sharing those human resources needs or accounting needs um, among a large group of providers in, in a way that when you work for an employer, you already have. Um, so those are, those are our largest recommendations to address the decline of family child care homes. Great. 
Thanks, Keisha. Um, I think we're going to leave it open now for questions or comments. If anybody, um, if you want to type it into the question box, we'll have Sherry read them out loud. Um, and here's, we have our contact information up here if you have um, any follow up. And I know people have been asking about the slides. Um, and we will provide the recording of this webinar as well as the slides. Um, we'll put them on our website. And um, I think we can also email them out as well. Hi, Gemma. Hello. Um, so we don't have many questions, but somebody asks if you can go to the slide um, before the Provider Insights page. This was quite a few slides ago. The, it was the slide before um, all of the quotes, like before this one. This yeah. one? Yeah. Um, Somebody asks, do we have access to the family child care survey questions? Um, yeah, if you want to send me an email, I can let you know that um, I think you're talking about the questions that we asked them in the survey. And, and yeah, we'd be happy to provide that. We do have a, um, a one pager with um, the results that I went over today um, and we have that on our website as well um, but yeah if you if you're curious about the specific questions they were asked then um, we can definitely provide that for you okay perfect um, we also have a question um, you said housing is a big issue for child care providers who have closed our family child care providers talking about difficulty finding housing or staying in their current housing, or is it just issues stemming from quality of housing and shared housing? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, unfortunately, in the survey, they it was just um, a ranking of the different issues, and one of them was housing. And so um, there wasn't a lot of explanation for that part. But um, we do know just based on the anecdotes and feedback from the r and r is that it's it's kind of all of the above it's a lot of these issues um part of it is the the quality and the size um the shared housing that I mentioned and um in terms of finding housing or staying in current housing i think so during the recession um being able to stay in your current housing was a big issue, and I imagine it does play a role still um but yeah, I think the answer is is a combination of everything. Okay, we also have a question that asks, it seems that one of the recommendations um, vouchers based on enrollment is dependent on if the provider has state subsidized children in the program. How would this policy recommendation solve the private sector market? Keisha, do you wanna take this it, one? <laughs> it is true that it, it that um, the voucher recommendation only um, um, impacts providers who are willing to accept a voucher child, but by making it based on enrollment, that would probably open it up um, to more people being willing to accept voucher children who would be paying by voucher because then that provider could depend on that stability, stability the same way that they can depend on their private pay um, family. Okay, and then somebody asks, what is the goal for today's webinar? Other than informing us with great information, what does the network want to see the R&Rs do more of? Hello? Um, I, Keisha, I don't know if you want it oh what 
So what is the point? Like, why are we hoping, why are we spreading this message of the decline of family yeah. shelter homes? I think or what, that... Um, what should the R&Rs do more of, or what can they do? Yeah. Right. And well, I think we, just one thing, too, yeah. is that this, this message is for, uh, you know, everyone, not just the R&Rs, right? So the, the policymakers, the legislators, that kind of thing. But go ahead. It is. Please. And the, I think, so... Um, most people on the phone on the webinar are from R and R's, but we do have people um, who who are who've been engaged in this hour um, who are not from R and R's, but, which is great because the one of the problems that we see when we're advocating is that a vital voice that is missing is that of family child care providers, um, and so in a lot of policy proposals out there. Um, family child care is left out or family child care is only included if family child care is part of a fetch-in. And the system is way bigger than that. It's an R&R &R, um, value that parents have choice and that and R&Rs are there to provide the broadest and widest choice possible. And that has to include home-based care, especially if we're going to have um, places for our youngest children to go, infants and toddlers, or places to go when you have non-traditional work hours. Um, so our hope is that by spreading this message, it, for R&Rs and for others out there, you, became, you become stronger and um, just unapologetic, unapologetic advocates of family child care homes and the state's responsibility to support family child care homes. So if you go back to that voucher question, a lot of providers, like, so a lot of families, whether they qualify for a voucher or not, or whether they receive that voucher, because we know there's like 2 million children out there who qualify for the voucher, their family needs child care, um, but they can't get help paying for child care because our state doesn't invest in it. But let's just say they did. We also need to make sure that there's providers who are willing to accept it. And so when um, you change the voucher system from um, the way it is now to being based on enrollment, more providers would be able to do that because they know they would have that steady source of income. But at the same time, there's, I feel, forces out there who think that just because a child is placed in a home or you're a home-based provider, that your quality of care doesn't match that of sinners. And we all know that that's not true, um, but we need to support family child care providers in lifting care, and which means paying them to be able to do that and afford to do that, um, lifting quality, I mean, paying them to be able to afford to do that, um, but also making sure that we debunk that myth that home-based care isn't, um, isn't as great a place to put a child as center-based care, and that it's ultimately up to a family what best fits their needs. So um, that's a very long-winded answer to say why why we did this today, why we want this information out there, um, and what we want you to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to add to the other, the previous question too, about the private sector market. If, and so if a provider has, um, if they have some children with subsidies and they're making like such a a small amount with it, then they're going to have to compensate by charging the, the private pay children more. So if they're getting an adequate amount from the, the subsidy children, that will probably have an effect on the rates of the private market. And then also the issue of um, family child care homes having more difficulty getting any kinds of grants or public funding, that's sort of like the third um, funding stream that needs to be there because it's not affordable for parents. The providers aren't making enough money, even if they have all private pay families. And so there has to be a third piece going in there too. And that was in one of the quotes actually from the providers is having access to that third piece of funding. Okay. So um, the next question is, since FIRST Five started in this state and many FCC providers have been required to attend college classes in their quote unquote spare time, taking away from their personal time and their time that previously was used to attend um, FCC association meetings. Local FCC associations are currently lacking in most areas of California. Is there anything being done to revitalize these important peer support groups? Can 
Tasia, do you want to? I'll speak just that I I personally am not that connected to like FCC associations. Um, yeah, and I know that they are important peer support groups, and I know that I've seen the um, the association maybe once or twice in my short career here at the network. Um, and I would guess that goes that um, I would uh, surmise that that goes back to the association is made up of providers, and if everything, whether it's a hearing or a meeting, happens during the day when those folks are providing care, how do their voices get out, um, and how do they go? How do they yes take classes in their spare so quote unquote spare time, um, and so. Even if you look at that one, the slide that Gemma showed of quotes is like have, being able to have substitutes to be able to one be sick, <laughs> two um, be able to participate in their own professional development is important. But I do think it's a voice that uh, that is very weak in this advocacy, and I, do, I don't know the solution to that because we don't have substitutes. Etc. Because all of this work happens during the day when providers are caring for our children. Um, so another question about the provider insights slide. Could you expand on the regulations and requirements portion of the provider insights slide? Is this, is this just from licensing or are there other regulations and requirements that create barriers for providers? Um, so I think the the majority is from licensing, um, but if they're being, you know, they're being asked to go to to more trainings or do um, so some of it is those kinds of things that right take time that they most of them don't really have and they're not um, necessarily getting paid anymore for doing them or um, even really getting like respected more for doing them. But the other part too is um, for the providers that are participating in the quality program, there's, um, they are required to have people come in and rate them. And for them, it feels like judge them on things that they've, um, you know, been doing for a lot of them, they've been doing for years. And um, so, and this is based on things that I've heard from um, providers is that it, it's kind of, like a disheartening and personal experience to have somebody come in and do that. And, um, you know, we understand that having high quality is important, but you can imagine being a childcare provider, getting paid very little and having to go through like all of these hoops. And then at some point it's just not really worth it. Somebody asks, um, please clarify the proposed increase of IT pay, or are you speaking specifically about subsidy or providers increasing rates for private pay? No, yeah, only I'm speaking only about subsidy, the infant toddler factor for subsidy. And as Gemma um, said in one of her slides, provider parents can't pay more, but providers can't be paid less. Um, so in, in our this specific recommendation, it is only um, referring to subsidy, but in general, um, ch early child care, early childhood education and child care, really, if we, if we want to be very progressive, could and should be supported like public education starting in kindergarten or pre-K, um, in that um, it should be supported by society because we as parents, we can't pay more. If you've had to pay child care bills, you know you can't pay more. Um, but if you work as a provider, you cannot possibly earn less. You can't ask for less. Um, so there has to be some sort of relief provided um, in the middle. Um, but I'm absolutely not suggesting it comes from parents, but the voucher proposal only ap applies to subsidy. Great. So somebody comments, um, but there is a regulation that prohibits child care providers from 
cha uh, charging private pay families different than subsidized children. In other words, the cost to families based on enrollment attendance isn't different for subsidized children. So I think this was um, in reply to the previous question. Yeah, it's yeah. totally true that, that when you when you um, when you accept children with subsidy, you can't charge more for private pay. Um, and so the state of California definitely sets the the market rate basically um, for childcare wherever you live. And um, yeah. And I so I think this is in response to what I said. And I think so. Um, it's not necessarily that that an individual provider would charge their private pay families more to make up for having the subsidized families, but just in general, it affects the um, the market, you know. And even if the subsidized families are technically being charged the same rate, if they're not being um, if the provider isn't being paid based on enrollment, and if they're only paid like for the you know the minutes and the hours that the child is there, then it's gonna um yeah it'll it just in in more globally affect the the cost um so there's a comment from linda that says the data shows that without the love of these providers to do this it points to fcc is at risk if no intervention to turn the decline this affects um equity in our system for parent choice pro for providers many whom are women. So this information is also to help advocate for the right solutions. So I think this was a response to um, how important this is. Um, and now someone else says, there's opportunity here to for r and to provide budgeting trainings to providers and helping them to project their income from childcare sub subsidies and private pay. And then, um, Somebody asks, um, so great data on the past 10 years and the decline. Is there a decline occurring in other states as well? So I, um, I think the answer is yes. I don't know if it's as drastic as California, but um, yes, it is happening in other states. Um, so somebody says, in the recommendation of shared services model, this could also um, be recommended that organizations partner together, for example, R&R's first five quality counts agencies to share their assessments of the providers, thereby reducing the number of visits from assessors from different organizations that come into the home of providers who are participating in quality counts and other quality initiatives. Um, and then there is a long question. Somebody says, most of our FCC providers come into this field without business training. Complete business training is necessary, which covers all aspects of the business. Working with children is something they expected when opening their homes. However, the understanding of regulations and health and safety codes, understanding the financial responsibilities placed from the IRS or EDD when hiring employees when the small income has to pay for these small um, for when the small income has to pay for these many services they tend to find their own income not effective to support their families is there any thought in incorporating business training covering all aspects of the businesses of family child care um, so I, I know that the local SIP projects do include um, business training in TA, and I, I'm sure it varies by R and R, but um, I know this is something that they do support with. So, um, yeah, and you're you're right that I think this is, from what we've heard, one of the most difficult things for providers is the business aspect of it. This is also another thing that would be helped with the shared services model if there's, um, you know, if there's somewhere they can go for that kind of HR business support um and and in a way that they like support each other and can pool their resources then that would also help okay so we have one more question um somebody asks have you documented local or county practices in states where capacity has recovered um for example the counties in green 
in 2017 on that one California map versus 20, uh, 2008? Yeah, so like San Francisco is, is um, always the anomaly with this. And there's a combination of factors for this. And um, Keisha, I don't know if you want to talk about that. San Francisco has chosen to invest in early childhood, early childhood and education, um, and that investment one helps a lot more parents be able to access and pay for childcare, and it helps providers be able to stay, <laughs> sorry, to stay in business. Um, and it's a, it's a way different um, way of of treating its system within its borders than the state does um, around, than the state does. Um, and so, yeah. And also, well, there's there's so many things that barriers, other barriers that we didn't talk about, such as um, zoning laws, which we are also trying to address this year. Um, through legislation, but that make it difficult for people to stay in business. And in San Francisco, it may be easier um, in some cases um, compared to other parts of the state. But in general, yes, San Francisco has made this investment. So it's not just depending on the state dollars. They've um, they have raised revenue within its borders to be able to subsidize a greater number of families, be able to support providers in a way that we don't see elsewhere, which is why San Francisco is green. Um, somebody also comments, San Francisco also has very strong um, FCC associations. Just adding to that. But yeah. um, I don't see any other questions for now. Okay, great. Um, if you have any questions that pop into your head after the call, feel free to email either me or 